questions. I think we had a fantastic morning session with some great food for thought from our panelists. So I'm, I'm hoping that our next panel li live up to that standard. Um, so just, just to briefly recap, we have a panel for an hour now led by Rianne Salmon, who will introduce all the panelists on science communication. And then we've got um, talks from Geoffroy Lamarche from the Parliamentary Commissioner from the Environments Office um, and Luke Oldfield on the results of a survey of precarious academics that was done this year. And then we'll finish up uh, with Troy's President's report for the NZIS before we have a break and then we move to our AGM and awards. So for now I will let Rianne and her panel take it away. Kia ora, thank you so much. Um, so sorry, just sorting out my technicals here. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Crystal Palace te maunga, ko Kam te awa, no Engarani a Hamene a Ho, Ke Otaki a Ho e no Hoana, Ko Rian Salmon Toko Ingwa. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rian Salmon. I have a background as a scientist, a science communicator, and a researcher of public engagement. Um, I work at Te Waka in the Centre for Science and Society, and with uh, Te Punaha Matatini, who we've heard about a bit about earlier, and I've been asked to chair this session today. This panel, in line with the overall theme of the conference, is going to focus specifically on challenges and opportunities related to engagement with science in Aotearoa. So in that context, I'd like to open the session by reflecting on words of Te Pue Hirangi, apologies if I said that wrong, that Dan Hikaroa recently shared with the Te Punaha Matatini community. Mahia te mahi hei painga mō te iwi, which means do the work for the betterment of the people. And I think that should maybe be at the heart of all of our efforts to increase engagement and dialogue about science in Aotearoa. So we have a fantastic panel today, including among them uh, people who have experience as scientists, science policy advisors, communication professionals, media, community engagement, and engagement with the research system. Several of our panelists wear many hats. Several of our panelists have had many roles and have a lot of experience in this space, and many have experience with many or all of these aspects. So we'll shortly be hearing from Gary Evans, Fleur Templeton, Vanessa Young, Pauline Harris, Dave Frame, and Daisha Herbalock. In the interest of time, and also not wanting to label anyone according to just their current roles, I'm not going to provide a long bio for everyone. Instead, please check out the bios on the conference website, which I will paste into the chat. There you go, you should be able to see it now. And that's where you can learn more about people or a simple Google will probably take you on a bit of a trail as well as I found. Uh, so talking of the chat, chat space, please, please do feel free to use the chat to make comments or ask questions while our panelists are speaking. Georgia Carson, who you met earlier today, will be inside the chat space collating comments and questions. And after each of our panelists has spoken, she will share your questions and comments for the panel to respond to. Um, I think that's the best tool that we have because this is a webinar setup rather than a Zoom, the other kind of setup where people, everyone can speak, but um, I'm happy to go with whatever the technology allows us to do. But, but we have definitely allowed time at the end of this for a conversation with participants at this conference as well as between the panelists. So I've asked each of our panelists to start by sharing a key challenge or a key opportunity which for them, you know, something that they think is a key challenge or opportunity related to engagement with science in Aotearoa before sharing their thoughts on this topic more generally. I'll give them a nudge after five minutes. I'll be a little bit firmer after seven minutes, but assuming everything runs smoothly, we should have plenty of time for discussion around ideas and questions that come up in the chat space and a bit of a Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I will hand over to Gary Evans. Uh, thanks, Rianne. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Kapukutama Haka te moanga, ko Pakahakia te awa, ko Robert Henson te waka, uh, ko Gary Evans uh, toko inoa, nga mihi inui ki koutou. I'm Gary, I'm uh, originally from Otipoti down south uh, where I grew up and then did my degree and PhD before heading off overseas for a while. Coming back, I, I was 
am a bit shocked uh, when I came back because I always wanted to be a DSIR scientist. When I came back, it was no DSIR, so that was kind of tough. Um, but but made my way into the CRIs in the end, and I suppose that's kind of where I wanted to go today. Maybe I misunderstood the mission, but um, when I think about the biggest opportunity um, in terms of comms, particularly from my perspective, is it's it's talking to the sector scientists. Uh, and the community around uh, future pathways to our departing. And I know the minister probably had a, a pretty good preso on that this morning and, and talked extensively about that. But I think that's the biggest opportunity that I can see, the ability to engage and reshape Aotearoa's research system. And it certainly wasn't an opportunity that I got 30 years ago, you know, kind of happened, um, the, the DSR being split up into all the uh, different component uh, CRIs. Um, and, and there was no engagement. Uh, whereas here, I think it is uh, going to be something quite different. In terms of the biggest challenge with that, I think is ensuring that engagement's equitable, you know, that we, we do talk to the entire sector, both people who uh, may be benefiting from research, science and innovation, uh, let alone the practitioners of that. And, and so how do we ensure that's equitable, particularly with you know, a variety of equity groups, Simon, Pacifica, uh, the disabled, etc., and, and then how do we weight that um, that, that um, engagement? Um, uh, that'll be our challenge. I, I think the minister would have made it pretty clear that you know that we want this to be very much a consolidated process. It's going to be a relatively long process, and so there's plenty of opportunity, I think, within that to ensure that we talk to as many people as possible about what our RSI system should look like going into the future, so it is future proof, so it better responds to, you know, the Titariti and, and, and our obligations there, that um, we understand how as a country we're going to set priorities, uh, and then how we're going to fund the research around those research priorities, uh, because at the moment I think it's, um, opaque's probably not the right word, but it's um, not necessarily a straight line between uh, the research we're required to address our priorities as a country versus um, the, the, the funding system and how you obtain funding because there's an awful lot of competition set up throughout the system uh, and there isn't a, a massive uh, uh, percentage that do get funded. I mean, it's a very uh, competitive system and, and there's a fair amount of waste within that and, and you can't dial up, if you're wanting fresh water, you can't dial up fresh water research necessarily through that process. So how do we how do we do that going forward? Do, do we have a marginal cost or a full cost funding system? You know, what are the advantages of one versus t'other? Uh, can you then provide stable long-term funding to institutions? How would you change that over time? How would you, you know, when new institutions come along or old ones wax and wane, how, how does that adjust? Um, and then, you know, what are the institutions? I, I think MB is kind of agnostic about who provides the research to address the priorities, but, but you know, what do our institutions look like going forward? I've been part of a CRI that in 2010 was <laughs> uh, subject to review, uh, ceased to exist. I'm probably gonna get my dates wrong here, but it was about 2013, I think it stopped and Cali Innovation started. And then, um, you know, I've ended up where I am now, which I didn't really say in my intro, but that's in Victoria University in a research only institution. And over that time, at least until my lab burnt down, I, I was in the same office in all three institutions. So it's kind of been a, a surreal experience going from a CRI to an innovation agency and then into a university. And I have to say the university is a great employer. Thank you, Victoria University of Wellington. Um, but, you know, what does our workforce look like going forward? You know, um, how do we ensure the research workforce is dynamic, connected and diverse? And, and you know, that connectivity extends to how we communicate with each other, with the sector, uh, and, and, and you know, how we make use of that engagement. Um, and then finally, I suppose, it's a, what do we do with regards to infrastructure? And there's a lot of different sorts of infrastructure, both hard and soft. And if I think of soft, it's more around things like collections and databases where, you know, you've got this fantastic pool or reservoir of data data that we may not even know we need, you know, at this point in time, but over, over time, new technology or new challenges come along where those physical specimens are, are really critical to um, the research we might do going forward. And so those are my opportunities. That's my challenge. 
how do we engage and, 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 and how do you engage as a sector, particularly when you've got so much on, everybody's got so much on. Uh, if it's not the competitive bidding system, it's you know just trying to uh, cope with, with COVID and all the challenges that come as part of that. But you know, I think it's worthwhile prioritizing this uh, engagement process. And again, as I, as I said at the beginning, you know, what is uh, how do we ensure that we have an equitable engagement system? And I think this is where uh, organisations like the NZAS and individuals play a key role because they can call government out. You know, I'm here, I suppose, on the inside, trying to keep an eye on uh, what's happening, um, making sure that what the minister and, and officials say is is happening will happen. Uh, but it's great having people like uh, Tara McAllister out there calling the ministry out when uh, you know they say they're going to do something and, and they don't. So uh, your participation is critical going forward. So I think I'll stop there because really what I want to hear is uh, what everybody else thinks and what you think. Hilda, thanks, Gary. That's great. A great, great opening there as well. Thanks so much. For those of you who joined maybe just um, after we'd started, uh, there is a Q&A uh, area where you can write questions. You can write questions for Gary or for anyone or things that you'd like raised later. Um, we thought we'd, we'd hear from everyone first and then and then move to the Q&A just so that we don't end up kind of getting carried away on one thing and, and running out of time at the end. So, but please, if you've got questions or responses to what Gary said there and also ideas around how to make engagement equitable, which was the major challenge you put forward there, then um, pop them in the Q&A. So we're gonna hand on next to Fleur. Tēnā koutou, nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Talofa, malo, elele, and greetings everybody. Ko Flu Temple and Toku um, Very grateful to be invited to be on this um, panel and grateful to Rian and Georgia for all, and others for organising and the New Zealand Association of Scientists. Um, very topical, interesting converse, conversation and conference so far. Um, Rian's asked us to really come up first with an opportunity and challenge on engagement. Um, my current role is working as Knowledge Exchange Manager at Healthier Lives, which is one of the Healthier Lives Hauranga Hauora, one of the 11 national science challenges. Um, and when I reflected on this, um, I think that our biggest opportunity, which is also our biggest challenge, is digital engagement and social media. Um, these two, a huge opportunity um, offered to us, and in a minute I'll reflect on my past history, which was before digital engagement, and it offers a huge opportunity because we get the, the reach, the global reach, um, we get the two-way engagement that we're all looking for and talking about, and, and it's interactive. But with that comes the huge challenge, of course, um, that we're all dealing with <clears throat> the misinformation, the disinformation and the information overload. I don't know about all of you, but um, I've got about three or four conferences on Zoom this week, um, things coming in at me all the time and I'm battling to keep up with it. And um, I think everybody has that. So really to me, those are the big, well, to my main opportunity and challenge um, within engagement. Having listened to the SCANS uh, lunchtime conversation though, and this morning's, my other, I'm gonna sneak in another one, Rian, I hope that's okay. And it's um, co-design research, um, which we do a lot of in the science challenges and des designing research with communities, I think is gonna be key going forward because you're actually working with the communities, you're engaging with the communities from the beginning, so that all your end users and communities, so the engagement is happening as we go. So that is a huge opportunity. Um, and there's probably a challenge in that is how do we co-design? And there's a lot of work that has come through from CRIs, universities and the science challenges on co-design It's coming through. And I think we really have to not lose that in the, um, in the changes we're looking forward to. So I just want to have a quick reflection, having said all that, um, where I started my career probably before Gary then at the DSIR, Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, which was pre-CRIs. And I was, um, it was my very first job as industrial liaison officer at the physics and engineering laboratory. I was probably a few hundred people. I was probably one of the only women there. 
and there were definitely no Māori and Pacific people working there. And um, one, and it was way before any kind of digital engagement or social media, but we did organise once a year um, open days. And um, I organised, I don't know if you can see that, probably not actually, because I've got my blur on, but anyway, it was the 1984 open days. <laughs> And I was looking it up the other day and we had 16,000 people coming to it. It was very interactive. There were kids jumping on earthquake shaking tables and going around and there were scientists standing beside display boards and talking to children, industry and the media. And it was, um, I'm thinking about it in these days of overload and engagement and digital. And it was actually a fantastic opportunity for people to interact and engage. And <laughs> It's a huge amount of work and maybe, you know, it's something like we have already the field days and things still, but I just sort of think there is something about that face-to-face -face or one-on-one -on -one and interaction. Um, and again, listening at this morning, I think it was Hari said about getting our tamariki and rangatahi inspired and engaged. And actually, they can be inspired and engaged through digital, but I think the face-to-face, -face, the meeting a scientist kind of real life thing, and maybe it's due to COVID that I'm, and everyone working from home that I'm just, I think we're all craving that face-to-face uh, -face and real interaction. So I think that's where I want to finish. Um, might have missed a bit, but um, I'll uh, close off now and then pass on and talk a bit later. Thanks Flo, that's great. But you were one of the people who I didn't want to give a, a title to because you've had many titles. <laughs> so I didn't want to label you just by your current role, but it's a kind of a collection of a life of experience in this space, which is great to have you here. Um, thank you. So in a similar kind of role, but different and a very different organization as well, we'll hand over to Vanessa Young. Thank you, Rian. Hira koutou, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou. I mai I te whanganui atara, i tipu ake au ki te whanganui atara, ok, ko Vanessa Young toko ingoa. So a challenge that I think we've all interpreted our brief completely differently, which I think is really cool, um, sitting there thinking, oh no, I got it wrong. Um, so for me, the, um, as an engagement person outside of government at the moment, it's often the opaqueness of MB and the other funders and the other parts of government. And I think that's a real challenge for researchers and um, knowing who to engage with. Um, the opportunity though, I think there are real opportunities for researchers to shape the system. And I know there's real appetite within government and I'm gonna speak more about that. Um, but firstly, yes, I work for the McDiamond Institute and we're hosted up here at VIC at um, Te Heranga Waka. Um, we do advanced materials and nanotechnology where our people make things really tiny down at the nanoscale and then they play with the properties and make new smart materials that could be a new solar cell or a new battery technology or capture carbon. And I firstly want to acknowledge um, Dr. Pauline Harris, who's here today, Ngā mihi nui kia koe Pauline, because she's the, the leader of our Māori um, research programme. And my role's a bit like a conduit, um, but there's a bit of strategy to it, which I'll come back to. So I just like um, Flew, I wanted to talk briefly about what I used to do. So I spent most of my career working as a central government policy person, first as an employee, but mostly as a contractor. Um, and you've probably noticed that us policy people, we move around a lot, we bounce from place to place. And um, like my first stint was 10 years at MFAT and I had seven different jobs in that time, seven successive responsibility areas. And that might be, you know, a bit extreme, but it is true that we bounce around and we take our soft skills and we go from job to job to job. And unfortunately we take our institutional knowledge with us. Um, which is where I'm coming to, is that I used to love it when experts came to speak to me. So I'd have stakeholders from various groups and sometimes they'd be opposing, but it made for a really important mix and I couldn't have done my job without them and it would inform our um, recommendations to ministers. So I've um, always been in that space that I welcomed um, expert engagement and, and yeah, comms. So coming back to my job now, at the McDiamond, we've always seen ourselves as part of the wider NZ Inc, if you like, because we're government funded, our people do cool things, we're trying to help with climate change mitigation, we're trying to support the government's own goals. 
So um, I've always seen it as our responsibility to, because um, we're government funded, to actually communicate what we're doing to government and to connect people amongst our researchers with the policy people. And my experience having been on both sides is that this is really welcomed and that there are real um, gains to be made for both parties. So um, comms is about saying the right thing to the right person at the right time in some way that they'll hear you. So um, it's the same kind of thinking applied to engagement. So we tend to, I mean, as others have said, people are, everyone's crazy busy, including those in central government. So we try to take a strategic approach and we think, well, who should we be talking to? Um, and why should they care? How can, we, how can we help them see what we are doing if, and, and help them in their job and, and open doors for our researchers and how can we you know, be impactful in this space? And I have some examples I can talk about later if there's time. Um, but it's ultimately all about relationships and that's about building genuine and trusted relationships and that takes time. Um, just lastly, one thing we've been doing at the McDiamond for the last few years is um, funding our new PhD graduates into three month internships around the place, so in industry and government and into non-government. So the paths to policy in the government sector that we call them is they, they spend three months between handing in their thesis before they do their um, exam defence. And they might be in various parts of MV or in environment or other places. And we get fantastic feedback from our students and good fantastic feedback from the places we um, can intern them. And the, I'm always so grateful to the people in government who make space for a newbie to come into their, um, into their world and see what the government side of the science system looks like. And it um, doesn't matter where these people go afterwards, whether they take that back to academia or, or into industry, or some of them actually stay in policy. I just think it's hugely, hugely valuable. And I'd really like to see us doing more of it, us, I mean, the wider us. I'd like us to do it at the mid-level and at the senior level as well. So, um, so if you're a researcher, then people like me who work in policy really need you. So if you're keen, don't hold back. And if it does seem a bit opaque at times, then come and find the person, whoever it is, who does a job a bit like mine in your organization and ask us for help. Kia ora, Vanessa, thank you. And I see what you did there. It was some nice targeting. You've assessed your audience. You're like, I've got a, got a conference full of scientists. So I'm going to target you with this message at the end there. Hope you all heard that. That's great. Really, really wonderful comments. Thank you. Um, Pauline, kia ora. Kia hoi. Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mahi nui ki koutou. Ko wai au, ko Pauline Harris ahau, nō rongo mai wahi ni ngā te kaungunu ki wairua, ngā te rākā, rākai pāka, Okay, he mahi mahana kia koutou. Um, I'm a senior lecturer up at the Centre for Science and Society with Rianne, also in the McDiamond Institute with um, Vanessa, and I'm also a um, theme leader for um, SIFTI, the Science for Technological Innova and Innovation. Um, so um, I actually wear like about 10 million hats as well. So I do a lot of work around, uh, my original training was around astrophysics and I did my PhD back then in that area and cosmology. And then I um, got asked to give a talk, so an engagement opportunity to talk about Matariki. Uh, this was back in 2001, but I'm just giving this as an example because I didn't know anything about Matariki back then. So I was asked to talk on something I wasn't an expert on. But this is 20 years ago, okay? So I'm not too bad now. But um, that kind of says quite a lot really is that we're expected as a Maori um, scientist, we're expected to know, I think everything, yeah? Um, and, um, and that's a real um, issue. And that's because one of the issues are is that there isn't enough of us. And I'll, and I'll come back to that in, in, a, in a moment. But I guess I just wanted to give examples of, um, I give a huge amount of an, um, public, do a huge amount of public speaking, um, taking a little bit of a rest on it probably over the last year and a half, obviously. Um, a huge amount of outreach, so I started and started um, a program called Tuhono Ipiao, which was um, an education program for Rangatahi Māori and Pacific that reached, it's reached over, well over 10,000 and that's run through um, some um, 
uh, Te Ropu Awhina now at Victoria University. So those are real big um, engagement things with um, rangatahi in our communities. Um, I've given, I don't know how many talks to our Māori communities about Māori science, um, climate change, um, matariki, maramataka, our, our traditional calendar system. Uh, just a huge amount of um, real diverse type of kōrero. Um, and I also give advice to government. So that's a different type of engagement, right? So engagement. That's probably one of the more challenging ones I've got to say. And very slow. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then the other one is media. Um, you know, we also have to be good at doing interviews, or TV interviews and radio interviews. And so basically it's like a unicorn. So me and my colleagues kind of joke about the fact that, you know, when we have Māori positions and stuff like that advertised, if they are advertised, is that they always want this unicorn that doesn't really exist, this person who can do everything. And uh, that puts a lot of pressure on us as Māori scientists um, in terms of our Required, what's required of us or what we feel we're responsible for in terms of engaging and advising and all of that. Um, I really like the ones that I work with. You guys are great, by the way. But um, yeah, just I'm not like dropping news in it. But um, I just kind of want to talk about, you know, there was a paper produced by Jared Hart and Willie John Martin a while ago about um, double shift or double, triple duty. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's a really big issue. And, and the issue is, is that we have to wear multiple hats and then do all these engagements all over the place. And so it leads to exhaustion and burnout, yeah? Um, and so, and the problem is the root cause is that there's not enough of us in the system. And so that's another um, issue that was brought up, you know, by many um, researchers in, uh, in, over the years. Um, and more recently by the likes of Tara and Siriana, yeah, um, about that there isn't enough Māori um, and Pacific um, academics, but there's not enough Māori and Pacific also in the ministries, there's not enough Māori and Pacific in the CRIs. Um, I think the NSCs are a little bit better, um, but it's a huge problem what's put a lot of pressure on, a pressure on a lot of the Māori academics it might have come up in the other panel. I'm not too sure. I didn't see the other panel on Mata and Maori. But yeah, so there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of, um, but there's a lot of need because the system is changing and we need that advice and we need to give that advice. Um, and so, you know, of course, there's an opportunity there, right? There's an opportunity there to bring on these people who have these expertise. We have um, some. Uh, younger ones coming through that we need to nurture through a mentor but also we have those that have missed out that are older who have you know didn't have the opportunity to become a lecturer because there were no positions that could incorporate Mātauranga Māori or Mātauranga Pacifica so um, this is just in terms of you know that real need to develop our um, capacity um, across the board of the uh, RSNT sector so that's my opportunity, and before that was my moan. <laughs> All the main issues about the system. Um, but the opportunity also goes into our communities as well. So, you know, in the green paper and that we talk about, you know, what are the opportunities for Mātauranga Māori, right? And so um, I think the opportunity is, I want to see, this is what I want to see, I want to see our Mātauranga Māori be given and properly resourced in our communities to be able to flourish and thrive and for um, our putai o Māori to be able to, our Māori science to be able to flourish, um, flourish and thrive. And I would like to see that happen without um, previous groups of recent that would criticize those spaces from people who aren't knowledgeable about those spaces. Yeah, so because that's quite exhausting. So actually providing a, um, an opportunity to really grow those spaces and it should be defined by the communities themselves and what that looks like and um, by Māori, uh, Mātauranga Māori experts, we have our Māori scientists. So yeah, I look forward to seeing how that space grows. Yeah. Okay, kāpāi.
I don't know how long that took, but that should be right. Kia ora, Rehan. Kia ora, Kopo. Kapai, kia ora. Thanks, Pauline. That was um, amazing and very thought provoking. I expect there'll be quite a lot of questions and responses. Feel free, just another mention to everyone who's listening in, feel free to put just comments as well. Doesn't need to be a question, comments, feedback, questions in the Q&A area. And um, Georgia is busy collating these and then we will discuss them at the end. So thanks, Pauline. And again, thank you so much for coming. We, I kind of was very conflicted about inviting Pauline because it's another thing to ask her to do. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, to another busy person, everyone here, everyone, and I think in this whole conference is very busy. Dave, frame. Um, thanks. Um, so I just pick up on a couple of things that um, Pauline said actually that I had on my list as well. Um, one is kind of about the, for me, engagement is really not one thing. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. But, but one of them is this kind of a broadcast mode where you go out and talk to media uh, and you talk to a general audience. And the other is a more reflective or interactive kind of mode of engagement, which is where you've kind of talking to a group with a common purpose or some unifying uh, element. And um, I actually find the latter quite a lot easier because I feel it's more tractable. Um, and, you know, I do a lot um, with colleagues on climate change. So we have quarterly meetings with the Reserve Bank, for instance, and um, we meet with Treasury occasionally and, uh, and other, other uh, stakeholders. And, um, and that kind of, as well as other like a, um, industry sectoral bodies, um, trying to help them navigate climate policy. And I think that can be quite a foreign space for a lot of scientists. It can be a really challenging space. Um, it's very intense. Uh, people often, you know, we're quite bad for jargon as a, as a species, I think scientists, but, but so are policymakers and decision makers in, in other sectors. And there's a strong language component um, that, that you have to confront when you, when you go and work with those kind of, kind of groups. Um, they often have very short time horizons and very specific, they want very specific inputs at, at particular moments. And uh, for academics, um, there's a rhythm that goes with teaching, for instance, where there are occasions when you're just offline because you've got to mark um, or sort out exams and things like that. And uh, so there's kind of a, um, there's often a mismatch between um, the capabilities and the needs, uh, capabil the capabilities that you have and the constraints you have as a scientist and the, and the de requirements of decision makers. Um, and, uh, you know, those policy cycles and decisions can, can kind of be your only shot at having input for quite some time. Um, it's not always comfortable for academics to get caught in the crossfire. I've got a lot of experience of getting caught in the crossfire. Uh, I don't enjoy it. Um, it's... Uh, um, and I think universities have a very hard time valuing this kind of focused engagement, often because it's invisible. And it's invisible because you do get caught in the crossfire uh, and it's not an unalloyed uh, positive. It's not seen as being a positive necessarily to go and tell somebody that a problem they thought they were dealing with quite well is actually a lot harder than they think. Um, you don't always, people don't, people don't necessarily, you know, change is hard and people don't necessarily appreciate disruption. Um, on the broadcast side, I think there's something similar where, um, you know, different parts of the media appreciate different inputs. Um, I do think there's an issue with politicization of science in, in the media. Uh, it's not unique to New Zealand, but that's, that's pretty, pretty broad, really. And I think if the, any given media organization likes your stuff and they feel that you're, they're on your wavelength in terms of values and, and politics, um, then they, I liken it to a strike zone for a baseball pitcher that if the umpire, you know, um, likes your stuff, then they give you a very, very wide strike zone and say, chuck the ball anywhere and we'll call you an expert. And if they don't like your stuff, then they give you a very, very narrow strike zone and they try and make it seem like you've got a, you, that your expertise is in this tiny area and, and we'll go elsewhere beyond that. Um, and I think there's a little bit of that as well with, um, with uh, government departments where, one of the shifts in the 21st century in New Zealand that's been quite consistent under the administrations we've had is a move away from a free and independently advising 
civil service who would, um, what we used to say, it was advise fearlessly and implement enthusiastically into one where the, um, the uh, CEs, the, the chief executives are expected to deliver to ministerial brief. And that um, places constraints around the kind of information and scientific expertise that they're likely to want to uh, elicit. And I think that that poses both in the public domain and the broadcast media domain and in that political side, I think there are lots and lots of thorny traps and political risks for academics getting into this space. Um, and it's quite easy to feel exposed as an academic or a researcher. Um, it's easy to feel exposed in terms of funding and it's easy to feel exposed in terms of um, your reputation and your university or CRI's willingness to back you. So on one hand, I think engagement is terrifically rewarding, um, but on the other, um, I think it's um, a very fraught space. Um, and uh, it's difficult and you have to have a lot of confidence um, to go into it. And it's not necessarily always as rewarding as it might look from the outside. Is that a, that's a nice pessimistic note to end on. Thanks, Dave. That was great, very thought provoking. And, and like one of the panelists said earlier, everybody's coming from a very, very different angle, which is, which is fantastic. Um, so our last panelist is Daisha, and thank you so much for, Daisha, for joining us, Daisha. You're fresh off the back of the previous panel, which was amazing, and I had to kind of tear myself away from the last 15 minutes so we could prep for this one, but I look forward to going back and recording it. So Daisha bringing a Science Media Centre angle. Uh, no America, a ho, uh, ke te whanganui a tara i whanau mai aku peipi, uh, ki konei e noho ana tātou uh, o uh, mātou i te whanau, katoa e nai e nei, nō reira, tēnā kuta katoa. Uh, my name's Daisha Herbilock, I lead the hardworking team at the Science Media Centre. Um, I've been with the SMC since the very beginning, in 2008, um, came to it with a radio background, um, working on uh, science features and um, spent many hours um, interviewing scientists and getting to, to know their work and to um, find ways to tell their stories um, and uh, find the, the parts that are, you know, the relevant pieces to bring those out uh, for wider audiences. So the Science Media Center, um, you know, it's, we, we really link to, serve to link scientists with, um, with media primarily with the mainstream media has been our focus over this time, um, simply because of those really wide audiences. We are on very firmly on that, that broadcast mode, I would say, side of the, of the equation that, that Dave was mentioning. Um, that's our niche, that's where we specialize. And what we see is that um, there is such huge demand and growing demand from journalists um, to help them contextualize fast moving stories uh, COVID has been an incredible reset, I think, for everyone involved. It has been um, this breaking news story that never stopped breaking um, over months, over now, you know, uh, 18 months into it. Um, and it's really shown, um, you know, the, the, the benefit of the, the groundwork that we've been laid, <clears throat> that we've laid over, over the preceding time. I think that <clears throat> these themes that come up around trust and relationships and building up relationships. That's very much what we've seen as well. Um, there are ways to, um, you know, to, to, to short circuit it, to, to get right into the, the heart of things uh, when, when the need is high, but that's based on the, the trust that, that um, my organization and other really hardworking science communicators, scientists putting themselves out there to communicate topics over years and years, um, those relationships that they've built up in the media in order to enable that, um, you know, the, to, to change the culture in some respects where now it is something that instinctually for journalists coming into newsrooms, uh, when they are confronted with topics that have uh, any type of science dimension, they want to find uh, experts, they want to find researchers, people who can speak about the evidence base and provide that context uh, to help them um, analyze and get their head around what this actually means for the people that they are reaching out to. So in terms of an opportunity, one thing that we've seen, uh, COVID has had a huge impact on 
all aspects of our lives, but you know, the media was particularly shaken up, very hard hit in the early days of, um, of lockdown in particular. Um, we saw that you know, the, the, the revenue base, the, the advertising disappeared <laughs> instantly um, overnight for so many of the things as, you know, um, as, as we entered lockdown, but the intensity and the, um, I guess, sort of the calling that most journalists felt is sort of reinforcing the importance, the central role that they play, both in getting really essential information out to people when they need it in that really timely fashion and helping make sense of it. Um, but also in, in terms of um, holding, you know, asking the tough questions and, and holding to account the people who are making decisions. Um, so it has really been something that, you know, has, has highlighted the uh, incredible influence that um, public health expertise, that um, researchers across all domains, I mean, we've worked uh, with psychologists, we've worked with tourism researchers, we've worked with people um, who are specialized in working with, um, with their communities, you know, a couple of Maori researchers all across the board has been, um, you know, huge demand from, from the media side of things to actually connect and to find the people um, that can answer the questions that are right in front of that everyone's asking. Um, one of the things that's come out of it though is um, a, a bit surprisingly, I think to everyone's surprise has been a bit of, of a renaissance uh, in terms of uh, media side of things. We, we've seen, um, I think that early days people were saying uh, really worried about the future of their organizations, um, but we've seen quite a turnaround in that, um, you know, so many new um, media outlets, uh, magazines in particular, uh, lots of new things, uh, initiatives online uh, that have just come out of nowhere uh, and, and grown over this time period. Uh, there has been a real shift uh, within the media to, to reinvesting in their people. I think that um, some of what was learned during COVID was that the importance of, of trust and the importance of trusted sources of information. So news organizations um, like Stuff, like The Herald, uh, like RNZ, uh, TVNZ, Discovery News Hub, despite there being all these you know, changes and, and really intensity in, in how they've had to manage reporting on the pandemic, um, that they have been, uh, for the first time in, in many, many years, for us as the Science Media Center on the, the you know, the cusp of these, these two worlds, <clears throat> we've been seeing journalists leave journalism jobs to go to better journalism jobs and finding opportunities to do more um, investigative work, more in-depth work, um, a proliferation of, of podcasts, of things that can go into great depth on topics, things like sections that are explainers where it doesn't have to be news driven. They're literally looking for someone who can just show up and, and answer a range of, you know, just explore a topic uh, in depth. That's something that has just um, it's been popping up in, in many different, um, from different directions within the media and is a, a, a real pendulum swing that we're seeing. Um, so there are lots of opportunities for scientists to, who maybe aren't on as comfortable with that um, breaking news, you know, quick turnaround, uh, there are actually more and more niches that are growing up and there are more opportunities to find uh, the kind of engagement with media that suits you, that actually is you know, the kind of thing that you want to do and think can actually make a difference in helping people understand your area of expertise. Um, another thing that has happened, which has been really significant has been the advent of the Public Interest Journalism Fund. So this is a major investment, it will last for two years, but uh, it has created uh, so far 110 new journalism roles, and they're really focused on changing um, the makeup of newsrooms, who is there telling these stories. So really investing in Māori and Pacific journalists, in um, industry development, uh, training. So this is something that um, we're seeing a you know, huge opportunity as well. So similar to what, we're, what we are, the same conversations that are happening within the science community about equity, about representation about who's there telling stories, uh, those things are actually um, yeah, reflected very much in, on the media side uh, of the equation. And that's all happening in real time right now. There are new initiatives that are getting off the ground, so many jobs that are being advertised and new people coming into those roles. So uh, quite a lot of opportunity there. Um, in terms of the challenge, um, I'll just quickly mention that um, with the more um, uh, public facing that many scientists have been during this time, we have seen an increase in um, the exposure to online harassment and abuse. It, it is a real problem. It's not, um, it's reflected globally. Uh, we were part of a survey with the other science media centers around the world, looking at um, with COVID in particular, um, what kinds of experiences researchers had, and there was definitely uh, an uptick 
and being on the receiving end of, of, of abusive um, behavior. And so this is something that we're taking the initiative on um, starting to, to lead some, um, uh, there'll be a webinar soon uh, for those of you who have <clears throat> research organizations that you'd like to be involved in, in wrapping around with providing more support. Um, we're gonna be starting with a, um, talking to people who have experience with that and trying to build a bit of a sense of what's best practice in the space for how we support uh, researchers and how researchers can support each other and what the institutions can do to actually make sure that people have the tools they need and um, get the support that they need. Um, and it doesn't become a barrier to people stepping forward because it is so essential that we continue to have, um, we, that we see and hear <clears throat> from all of your um, disciplines and from all of the people who are involved um, in the research science and innovation system. Namihi kia koutou. Thanks, Daisha. Wow, there's a lot going on there. Thank you. Um, so we have had questions coming in reasonably thick and reasonably fast, which is great. Um, Georgia, I can see you're busy collating things that are coming through the chat and the Q&A. So rather than me read five different windows and probably miss the one I'm meant to be looking at, do you want to maybe relay a question or something that's come up? We've, we've still got 15 minutes, so I think we've yeah, got- Yeah, great. Yeah, so we've got a few. Um, I thought I would start with the one from Kate Lee. Um, thanks for that, Kate. So this is for Gary. Um, and it's, she says, again, I'm hearing that ECRs are uh, really being asked to participate in the Green Paper consultation to help shape the future leadership landscape of RSI in Aotearoa, especially as they are the research leaders of the future. However, many ECRs are facing an immediate crisis in terms of COVID impacts on our research our research outputs and due to the fixed term nature of our employment and the threadbare nature of funding, there's an imminent cull of research workforce. We know this as we have collected data to show it. Does MB intend to engage with researchers with urgency so that they can see what is happening? All right, I better unmute that's myself. A question, eh? <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. It's a good, great question. Um, so certainly we're aware of the issues in Auckland um, on Friday, I was talking with Peter Shepard, who together with Dave Grant at the University of Togo have raised uh, some of the issues in, in Auckland at the moment uh, due to lockdown. Uh, and of course, my, in my own research space, I, I collaborated a lot with researchers at Auckland and they've been talk, talking to me uh, particularly about accessing uh, equipment outside of their bubbles and just how difficult that, that is. Um, in this instance, uh, I've been talking to Kuna Lim, um, I think somewhere on this call, about early mid-career researchers. I know he's had meetings with the minister. I talked to the Otago, University of Otago Early Career Researchers Group last week. So, so more than happy to talk to people. We're more than aware of the situation and we've raised it with uh, both at a ministerial and at a, an official's level uh, about the current crisis in Auckland. And maybe in this instance, it's uh, up to your colleagues elsewhere in the country to do the heavy lifting while you, you know, cope with what you already have on your plate. Um, I, I know you've got some fantastic advocates um, throughout the system, both at a senior and, a, and at an early career research level, who can perhaps carry that conversation. Uh, but yeah, I think you've been heard. Cool, thanks, Gary. Yeah, I think that's something we need to um, talk about a bit more in, in our ECR Slack, and maybe we can put something together to, to send to you. Um, <laughs> There was, while you're there, there was another question for you from Ellen. Um, so she says, I have a part for Gary. How will MB ensure that there is, uh, there is actually equitable engagement and most crucially consequent systems change for groups that have been undermined or excluded by the RSI sector, but are very important for the future of it. For example, ECRs, Māori Pacifica disabled and other diverse researchers. In the first instance, both Minister Viral and Woods are very cognizant uh, of that equitable engagement and they're driving the ministry and the officials to ensure that they're talking um, to as many groups as possible. Um, and then of course, you've got everybody else um, providing input into who they should be talking to. But if there are groups that we're not talking to or aren't being contacted, then uh, we wanna hear about that. And that's where the NZDS and other groups have a role to play, I think, in calling it out that they don't see um, the engagement occurring. Um, you know, this will be a, a relatively long process. I mean, the first period of consultation is only until beginning of March, but the reality is this will probably go on for, um, you know, three to five years. And so um, there'll be plenty of time to 
keep the officials um, and ministers honest about that engagement and making sure that everybody's being talked to. How it's then reflected in what comes out the other end um, is a really good question. Thank goodness I'm a science advisor, not a policy maker. Vanessa, do you need a, need a job? No? Did you, <laughs> anyone else can respond if they want to to, to those questions as well. Um, otherwise might keep going. Um, sort of while we're on the kind of um, equity sort of ECR track, um, I wanted to ask, uh, there was a question from Fleur as well. So um, Fleur asks, Pauline specifically, uh, how can we all help take that pressure off that pressure you were talking about? Um, you know, Māori researchers having to work double, triple shifts um, in the current system and in the future without losing the advice and, and leadership. I'll just spotlight you. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, you know, because we do want to be asked and we do want to be included in the conversation. So, you know, don't not ask, okay? Mm -hmm. But what is actually important to ask and what is something you don't have to ask, you can just look up yourself. So that's probably like a first sort of thing that, you, you know, making sure that the questions are the right questions to ask the right person so that that person isn't overloaded. Um, learning about your own capability, like developing your own and your workplace um, um, capability. You know, a lot of the questions would be about te reo. I am not fluent in te reo, right? So I would say, how about we ask a language, language expert or you go and pay someone to do the translation for you? Yeah, but um, oh, I did have something else to say too. So, you know, oh, yes, yes, yes. So, you know how we have a certain amount of percentage like as academics that we have as um, we have our research, we have our teaching, and then we have, um, oh, what's the other part called? Oh, I should know this, sorry. <laughs> Service. Service, service. I think I think that uh, Te Heringa Waka calls it leadership now, but yeah, it's oh, traditionally really? known as service. Okay, so um, I definitely think for Māori academics, this is, would be awesome, is like, you know, some things we don't need to teach, then use that teaching time to give them more time if they want to, to be able to provide service and advice if they want to. Yeah, and that's a huge, uh, you know, it just alleviates or give them tutor support or, because um, there's so many extras and ands that, you know, how can you provide support? Science and Society is really great. Thanks, Rianne. You know, they're, they're very mindful because I know other colleagues, you know, when they get bought out the stuff, they still get their teaching load as well, as well as giving advice, as well as doing that, as well as that. You know, we actually have a good, honest conversation about our lo um, teaching loads and about how much we bought out and, you know, and do it properly how it should be. But I know other colleagues are just, it's all on top, yeah. It so, sort of leads into... Um a question that I popped in just sort of trying to prompt things but um as a as a Māori ECR um I just wondered if you if you had any advice for this is a very personal question um Māori ECRs like me who who feel like like I don't get me wrong I, I want to contribute I need to contribute like I'm, I'm I'm going to but there are days where I feel pulled in too many directions and I'm wondering if you have come up with any solutions for trying to pace yourself I suppose and or finding a mentor. Yeah. It is the art of saying no, <laughs> which I think most of us probably on the panel need to learn as well. But you have to say no, stand your ground and say, I need to develop my career. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, have, if you can get a mentor. But that's the thing, right? Because we need the senior mentors. You know, we're going to build up. People kind of look for the ECRs coming through and they want to give them jobs and stuff. But they probably need to pull in the older ones who missed out as well to be the senior positions. And they've got senior, um, yeah, because we see our junior people being asked very senior questions, which is really, I mean, lovely opportunity, but kind of unfair because the experience isn't there. Mm -hmm. But there's no different stuff, you know? So I think um, just holding your ground. No one knows everything, you know? So it's okay not to know. Yeah. Or to point them to, in another direction. Kia <laughs> ora. I always have to go. Oh, I'll go talk to them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we also had a question from uh, Colleen for Daisha. I'll just spotlight Daisha as well. 
Um, and Colleen asks, can Daisha comment on Dave's comment about how engagement with media can be fraught? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I we have so much experience um, watching, you know, literally thousands of interactions, I would say, between <clears throat> scientists and, and journalists. And we also run a series of, of training courses, the Science Media Savvy. I can see a number of um, people have come through our workshop. We're here on the call today. Um, and, you know, one of the main things that people um, realize through that, that, you know, the time they spend with us is around, um, you know, a lot of times there are quite strong concerns, uh, but maybe not the likely to stack up with the experience that they have. I mean, it's actually quite a lot that you can do um, to protect yourself and to actually feel like, you know, the engagement you're doing with media is purposeful, that it has, you know, it serves the strategic aims that you have um, and that you actually really do have quite a lot of say and a lot of control in, in how you choose to engage and in the way that you prepare for that. So um, it's not about being defensive. It's really about just thinking through um, and, and building those relationships up as well. Um, we always bring journalists and scientists face to face through those uh, experiences and the universal uh, feedback is that people see the journalists as different from the stereotypes that they had going into it. Um, there are a lot of really inc incredibly hardworking people there who, who want to get things right and who really want to, you know, they're mindful of the impacts on, on people like yourselves in doing this. Um, some of those concerns come from people worrying what their peers will feed back to them. Uh, and those are things that, you know, again, we're thinking through uh, ahead of time. And, and once you've um, worked out exactly, you know, and are solid for yourself what you're trying to accomplish by talking to the media, what's the purpose of this? Who are you going to reach? And why is this the way to do it? You know, it reaches a very, very broad number and it's very still influential <clears throat> in responding. You know, if there are things, there are conversations that are happening anyways, we want to see um, people who are close to those issues, who really know and have the experience to be part of those conversations and to be engaging in those conversations. So there are ways to do that um, in, in, in meaningful ways that are not going to um, expose you to, to those risks. Uh, and we are here to help as well. There, there are people like Vanessa, um, resources like the Science Media Center, you know, they're there to support you and to prepare in ways that are going to be helpful. Kia ora. thanks, Daisha. Um, so I think we've, we've probably not got that much more time, but um, I think I wanted to read out, there's a, there's a big comment from John here. Um, I might just sort of summarize it. Um, so John's talking about um, the sort of loss of institutional knowledge when when DSIR was was broken up. So that's something that some other people in this call might know more about than I do. I'm only 29, so I don't remember DSIR, obviously. Um, but yeah, there's a very important point about loss of this institutional knowledge, um, which he says that he sees more clearly now than he did at the time. Um, historical data was lost. Um, and so that's sort of the start of you need to know what was lost to know what the future should should be. Um, and then he gives an example about GNS and having continually up updating databases. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the CRI perspective. Um, and you can read that whole comment if you, if you want to. So I think we probably want to wrap up so that we have time for Jeffrey to start at half past. So shall I hand you back to Rianne? Sorry if we missed out your question, um, but get involved on the Google Sheets. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Georgia. Can you see this screen that I'm just briefly going to share? Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your very, very thoughtful and insightful comments. I'm just going to quickly summarize. I may have missed some along the way because there were quite a few opportunities, actually quite a few challenges, not so many opportunities. Um, <laughs> but it seems that I think it's worth just reflecting that some of the real challenges are related to how to make engagement equ equitable that came up in a few ways the challenge of digital, the opaqueness of different parts of government, not enough Māori and Pacific researchers who are actually, and Pauline's point that um, they're expected to do everything and we need, we need to build capability across the system in policy and in science. Um, there are a very wide uh, number of interpretations and skills needed to do, to do engagement and who do you mean and what's, what are the outcomes. Um, learning the language of policy uh, and the mismatch between um, the 
sometimes the capabilities and, and, and time frames of scientists and the needs of decision makers, the politicization of science in media and in ministries, um, demand from journalists, We've already had different expectations of engagement and online harassment and abuse. It's quite a lot of challenges. There are opportunities related to the green paper, which we discussed a lot today, um, digital engagement, co-design, opportunities to change the system, opportunities to bring on new capability, new Māori and Pacific researchers, um, to change and contribute and reinforce the media landscape and the change in journalism. Um, that's just kind of a quick insight into a very wide breadth of things we've talked about here. Clearly, we could have broken this up into 10 different panels, but that would be for the SCANS conference, not the NZAS conference. So I really want to thank NZAS for, for putting in a slot which is focused on engagement. And um, I want to say thank you very much to all our panelists and especially also to all our participants who are beaming in, because I know you could be somewhere else and you're probably multitasking. So thanks for paying attention to the bits that were of interest to you and uh, happily to see you online somewhere else. Kakite. Kia ora. Thanks, Rianne. I think pass back to you, Lucy. Yeah, Thank you, uh, Rianne and all of our panellists. That, um, that was a fantastic uh, panel, and I think there's some really interesting stuff which will contribute to the NZAS um, Te Ara Paerangi response too. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who is Geoffroy Lamarch. He is a Chief Science Advisor for the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. Before that, he was um, at NIWA for 21 years, as well as an Associate Professor at the University of Auckland. Um, and way back in the day, like many of our scientists, he was with DSIR. So he's experienced that entire move through the science system from DSIR to where we are now and this new, um, this new call for understanding it. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing what he has to say to us um, about engagement and about working in his particular position. And over to you. Uh, kia ora everyone, let me share my presentation. All right. So tēnā koro katoa, no parani hao, ko Ngāti Uwi toku iwi, e no ana o ke te whanga nui atara i e nai ane, ko jopwana maas toko ingoa. No rera, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. So my name is Geoffroy Marsh. Um, pronounced slightly differently from what I've heard today, but I'm used to it. I've been in New Zealand for now uh, 36 or 35 years. I actually arrived in New Zealand the day of Cyclone Bola on the 10th of March 1988. And when I arrived, the plane must have landed on the on its back or sideways of some idea where where have I arrived? And there was the country was completely locked in their house and and I should have been the sign, but 35 years later I'm still there and I don't regret one second one second of it. So that's for my Fakapapa back to France, Nati, where, as I said, and Nati Wiwi. Oui, oui. And uh, after that, I, I joined DSIR and I saw the last year of DSIR and then I went from geology and geophysics to geology to genes science and then to NIWA and the rest is history. I joined the PCE, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, which I will call PCE from now on to save a bit of time because I've only got 20 minutes. The PCE about two years, well, actually almost two years ago by the day, not quite by the week. And over the last two years, a lot has happened at the, at the office and I want to go back a bit about that. So uh, Troy asked me to go through over three things. The first thing is who we are, what do we do at the PCE, who is the PCE, what's the specificity of the work we do, and especially what's the work of the chief science advisor does at the PCE. And then I want also to take a bit of time, quite a bit of time to go over the review of funding and prioritizations of environmental funding that we published last year. And first, because it's quite relevant to this corridor, but also because there are some many synergies and differences with the pathway, the future pathway programs and work um, and program of work, which has just been published, la or published last week. And then hopefully that will provide an insight of what was advertised yesterday on Twitter, thank you. Uh, which says, catch new angles on how scientists can make a difference and reshape our research on some technology systems. What's the role of the CSA for the PCE? Thanks for the acronym, Chief Science Advisor to the PCE Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. No pressure. 
And because the role is about me, okay, but the, the, the role is really, my role is really intrinsically connected with that of the commissioner and he contributes as both. So I've talked a bit about me and now I need to talk about the commissioner. So the reason, the reason for having a commissioner for the, a parliamentary commissioner for the environment, and we must not forget the P in BCE, was given in 1986 when the Environmental Act was written. And that's actually the Environmental Act that defined the role of the commissioner. And at the time they said there was a need for an independent authoritative advisor to parliament on significant environmental issues and a backstop of troubleshooter for major issues arising from the government environmental administration. Hence the word, the reference to a watchdog in my title uh, watchdog, as we refer often, we have the watchdog for the environment, or we have the official word for voice for the environment. So the PCE was established in 1986 as an independent officer of parliament. The PCE is one of the three officers of parliament with Ombudsman and the Auditor General. And this is often either overshadows or forgotten or left aside. And that's quite important because it doesn't report to a government minister, but it reports to the Speaker of the House. So report to the MPs, to Parliament, he report to the public of New Zealand, and it makes him truly and wholly independent of the government of the day. And he's fiercely keen to keep this independence, believe me. He is possibly one of the rare, if maybe the only such commissioner for the environment in the world. And that's quite an honor and quite a, um, a task and daunting task to be his chief science advisor, believe me, I'll get back on that a bit later on. The present commissioner is Simon Upton, which I've got a photo of him here. And most, many of you will know of, of Simon Upton. He's uh, the creator of the CRIs. He was a uh, minister, of, he was minister um, in the 1990s and created the RMA, etc. And then he went to Paris. He's a very, uh, he's a Francophile. I am too. And, um, is is been it was back it's been back since 2017 where he was appointed for about a five years term his term is coming back to uh to and then next year and we'll see what happens next the commissioner is supported by a team of 20 so it's a very small team and i get back on that because the task is enormous and we've got a very small team to do it We're, but we span a very wide range of discipline from my chemistry geography statistics ecology biology you name it and of course we've got a cafe well i say of course you know in a very positive way we've got a maria advisor cafe and we all got also very strong politics through simon's a law uh, advisory road and planning and history the the function and the power of the commission are quite broad these functions, and here I really put four bullet points and then three dots at the end, so that you know they don't really stop there. But really, um, what we do is we review the system of agencies that and processes set up the government to manage the country's resources. So here we talk of, you know, we could review entire department, doc, ministry, or we can review specific one activities or decisions. But this requires us to investigate, of course, very very in depth the problems and where that's where the sounds evidence comes into the, the fore and that's where my role comes into the fore. We report on any petition and bid. We have to be quite selective on one report and what we make submission on because there are so many that we could and we are often that is often done at the request of the environmental select committee but not necessarily every MPs, the MPs are our prime audience, the, every MPs is encouraged to refer to the commissioner with questions or worries about the environment, but through the MPs, of course, every member of the public. And of course, we inquire on any matter that has, um, or may have had a damaging effect on the environment. And that is really where we spend most of our effort and most of our time and most of our resources. But overall, we encourage the preventive measures and remedial actions to protect the environment as a whole. And that's where really our role is. The advice we provide really take two ways, through submissions like you would do, like Pamba Republic will do, um, and also through our report where we um, make some comments and recommendations for policy changes uh, to government agencies. With that, the Commission has got broad power. It's got section 19 and section 20, which I've listed here, because they're the most important one. With the broad power come broad responsibilities and with um, 
And we are, of course, required to seek receive and respect to all the information we gather. And this is important to say because really it's designed to give every member of the public to come and see us and talk in a safe and confident manner and to speak frankly to assist the commissioners in investigations without fear of being uh, punished or whatever by, by what they're saying. So we, we really cover the, the, the whistleblower, if you want, of, of the day for the environment. So people often come to me, I mean, since I've been there, I say, but how do you select where you, you don't do that many reports every year, you do, we do three or four big investigations every year. How do you select them? Well, remember that um, we are, the investigation, uh, the discretion of the commissioner, and hence the section six, 16 of the, of the act saying, the commissioner may investigate any matter where the agreement may be or has been adversely affected. So usually we ask the three questions. How important is this issue? Is it irreversible? Extension of species. Are we getting toward a tipping point? Climate change. Does it build over time? Is it cumulative? Or is there a risk of cascading event? What is the geographic scale of it? Is it national? Is it local? Is it regional? But, um, and what is the time scale? Is it pervasive or is it, um, is it local and, and temporal? These are scientific questions about the physical characteristic of the environment, right? They need some degree of scientific judgment to answer them, but that's not the only criteria we have. Our approach today really is that there is less value in the office focusing on the issue that receive a lot of attention. This is the right, the center of the Goshen. They are the strong stakeholder government attention. Everyone is focusing on that. There's not much interest for us overlapping with governments and NGO and people who are focusing on the issues. We tend to have more interest in looking at the issues that are stuck on the right of the Goshens or emerging issues that are not yet taken off or issues that are under the radar. And I will talk a bit of a few of these in, in, uh, in the next slide. That's where the commissioner, because of his personality and his understanding of the role, has decided to focus his attention. And of course, in the, in the little starry thing there, there is the acceptability, acceptability factor. How excited are we about? Because we've got the luxury of being able to choose, we do choose that, that the area where we are the most interested. So what are some of the recent investigation we've done? So as I said, the investigation are the core of our work. As those investigations they have listed here, they take between 14 and 18 months, sometimes two years. With COVID, we took two years to do the last one, the space and the space and vital one. Two years with two or three, sometimes four advisors, senior advisors working almost full time on issues, a big investigation. The space advisor that was released last Thursday, so hot of the press, um, a review of how New Zealand manages weeds and threatened native ecosystem, was the two years of work, and it was really looking at. Um, what is the impact of exotic plant on the native ecosystem? And that's typically one that's under the radar in my, in my previous slide. Everyone knows about weeds. Everyone knows that our native ecosystems are, are poitekawa, rata, um, plants are under strife, but it's often not forgotten, but it's often put either in the two hard basket or, or there's a more important thing to do. And that's where the commissioner can make a difference. He said, this is really important. We need to do something. This is what I recommend we do. The commissioner also has a statutory role to come on and report um, on the reports produced under the Environmental Reporting Act. And that's the first one at the top there. And in November, in November 2019, so two years ago, just before I arrived, they reviewed the adequacy of environmental reporting in New Zealand. And there here, I really put in light the deficiency of the monitoring and the databases in, um, in New Zealand. And you make a very strong point that uh, the whilst environmental reporting was key and important, it's needed to have a big overview and review of the, of the systems. The latest of our report is a review on the impact of, of, of um, the next report is coming. Sorry, the next report coming is looking at the extent to which the environment has or hasn't, for that matter, been incorporated into the process for constructing well being budget. So, see, it's completely different. We're going from weeds, we're going from uh, environmental monitoring, tourism, and now we're looking at well being budget working with treasury. This one will come next week or the week after. It's really or maybe two weeks down, but it's coming before Christmas. 
Similarly, it will come, it will get some recommendations to the ministers and to the to the legislator of things that could be done better to integrate the natural environment into the well-being budget. And then early next year, we'll have another one, which will look at the, on the environmental fate of chemicals. There are about 150,000 chemicals in New Zealand, and many of them end up, are not properly regulated and end up in the natural environment. And they have a negative effect or an adverse effect on the environment, let alone on the human health. So see, that's where you already started your picture. I'm going from, I'm a marine scientist, uh, as I was said in my introduction, I'm, from Niwa, I was at Niwa and I was a marine geologist. All I know is what's beneath the water. And I love going at sea. I'm looking at the rock beneath the sea and I'm left here looking at weeds, at tourism, and um, what else, and chemicals in the environment. Both a challenge and both a challenge and a fascination as well. So I want to spend a bit of time on the review of the environmental research now. So this one, when I first joined the commissioner two years ago, he said to me, uh, pretty much on day one, he said, um, I'd like you to undertake a review of the funding and prioritization of environmental research in New Zealand. It won't take you long. You've got everything on the tip of, on the figure, on, on the tip of your fingers. You've been at CRI for 20 years. You've been at universities. You're, you're an expert in, you know, your well your sounds it's not a problem you know in two months time on this on my desk but it took us one full year to do it and that such is the complexity and difficulty of gathering the information first and foremost before we could even make some some um, decision some of you in the audience will have helped us there and thank you very much again so the report was published in 2021 but it takes even more significance today with the release of the mb's future pathway green paper on program of work last week because there are quite a few synergy and differences, and I'll get back on that as well. The purpose of the review was really to ask the questions, to what extent publicly funded environmental research addresses the most important challenges we face? But for that, we needed to know how much publicly funded research is spent. We needed to, do, to find who funds it, what is done and how it's done. And it's funny because the, 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 it's not really interesting rather, because the minister this morning said exactly this. He said, we need to know how the funds are spent. And that's what we did here with this review, but specifically for environmental research. The review was not about the adequacy of investment. We are not going to say there's not enough money in science because every single scientist said that and they're all right. They all want more money. But that was not really useful in this. It was more, if you want to have more money in science, well, first you have to know what it's used for. Then you can say we want it more because it's not used for the, web, for the right thing or whatever. And the science was not reviewing the science delivery either. Like we are not looking at reviewing the CRIs, the independent research organization of the university. We're looking at the funding system. So who funds what? First thing we need to know what is what. And to know what is what, we have to define what the environment is. And the environment can be limited to the natural environment, air and climate, biodiversity, ecosystem. But it can be also, um, it can be also broad, uh, a bit more larger, like uh, issues that uh, environmental sustainability. So it can include environmental sustainable production. It can include environmentally sustainable construction. Overall, we wanted to capture the many scientific domains that environmental research included, or includes, the traditional one, which have this name, and the domain that overlaps with agriculture, health, natural hazards. We also wanted to acknowledge that environmental research requires an ever increasing input from social science, urban and landscape development, construction, etc. And of course, firstly, secondly, and lastly, but all over that, we needed to emphasize that environmental research needed to embrace Mataranga Maori at the head of its enterprises. So we used the uh, New Zealand, the Australian New Zealand, um, uh, what's it called now, NZERS, what does that mean? The New Zealand, I keep forgetting, the social economic objective of the Australian New Zealand standard research. And they are the one that you've got on the left of your slide there. And for every daily uh, science funder, this one here is for the regional council, which I put because it's probably the one that less, more, less people know about. They actually fund $80 million every year in environmental research. And for MB, DOC, MFE, MPI, and, um, and the research council who created a graph like that one. I recommend you read the report. 
And so how much is it spent? How, how much does New Zealand spend in environmental research? Well, that depends on your definition, whether you take a broad definition or a narrow definition, and it depends whether you look at central government or the, or the general public funding, which include tech, PBRF, and the regional council. Overall, you've got around between $370 million and $516 million. Whatever number you take, it's not small. It's too small for any scientist, but it's not small if you look. If you walk on Lambton Key and you say, we're spending half a billion dollars on public on, on environmental science, what do you think? People will say, that is a lot of money. What are you doing with it? And we tell them, we show them those same key diagrams there. And they say, what? So on the left, you've got the funder. And on the right, you've got the outcomes. And you can see that everyone is funding everything. Is it following any strategy? Are, they, are there any line of sight between the outcome and the provi fund provider? Uh, they are now. So, it is difficult to assess and it's difficult to give an answer when you look at the graph like that one. Yes, New Zealand is doing fantastic sounds, but maybe we could optimize that. So that leads me to the recommendation that the, uh, this report did. Uh, we essentially made one recommendation. The report can sort of draft a few, but there was one recommendation which was to establish an environmental research council. Actually, the recommendation was to develop an environmental research strategy that would be best um, that would be best applied and put in place and supervised by an environmental research council. Um, we also very strongly, and that's that's actually rings that what the 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 green paper says, it says we also recommend that the research strategy that's developed by the research council should be developed and aligned with the funding. At the moment, there are several strategies, MPI, DOC, MFE, there is a, I've got their sound strategy and, and every Sierra has got their sound strategy, et cetera, but there is no line of sight between the strategy and the funding. And so it remains that every scientist can say, I'm following such strategy, I want some funding, but that there is no real uh, coherency with them. We even provided um, a number. We even said this, um, this um, ring fence funding should be about the amount that the government is putting, or central government is putting in on long-term research, about $250 million. And then we recommended that this on long-term research funding and council define the priority, um, work within the on long-term research strategy framework, ensure the continuing development of Mataranga Maori by nurturing cultural competencies, set the criteria for funding allocation, and the criteria does not necessarily need to be excellence and impact, or at least you need to define excellence. We've got a really good box about the, the criteria of excellence in the report. Allocate the funding both on negotiated and contestable, so we we'll recognize the need for both, the contestable being for emerging issues possibly, and the negotiated being for long-term research, because environmental research, environmental science need long-term research. And finally, the council should be accountable, of course, works transparently and be independent. So how does that link with the TRA Perangi Future Pathway Work of Program of Work? So I'm not gonna I'm not going to discuss the, the green pathways because first, because it's not really my role yet, the, the submission are due in early March, I think, but I will engage you all to submit on the, on the future pathway. It's been pretty clear from the, the, the workshop and from the launch and from the minister this morning that is a, a, a wide and open and a transparent consultation process. But the focus here, of course, is designed to the entire public research system where we focused on the environmental research system. The first thing I did is I took the PDF and I throw that to a word cloud uh, on the web. And that is what I come with. And I think it's actually recapitulated quite well. It's about the system, it's about the research, it's about setting priority, it's about including um, working in partnership with Maori. And I quite like the fact that on the, on the right there, you've got Sierra is small because while it says that, okay, it's not really about reviewing the CRIs, it also talks about uh, uh, fewer and larger organizations, structural reform, et cetera. So we need to keep an eye on what exactly what can come out of it. And, and I strongly, we will most likely uh, submit on this, on this paper. Uh, and I intend, of course, to be involved in the coming workshop. And our submission will, will be built on the commentaries developed in the three reports that I've mentioned. 
So the three report on focusing Aotearoa New Zealand environmental reporting system, the one that look at the environmental monitoring, the review of environmental research that I've just presented uh, a bit more detail, and then the one on well-being. The three ones will form, we will write in early in the next year, we'll write a synthesis report. So one to rule them all, so to speak, that will look at the entire research system from the applied monitoring right to how can it deliver um, what is needed for the well-being of New Zealander. And that's a continuum. And that's, that's the next report that we intend to publish probably mid next year. There's one thing that is, there's quite a few synergies and, and, and similarity between uh, the Future Pathway Program and our, and our um, report. And one that I didn't really develop because um, I don't have the time was about database and collection. There's just uh, one single chapter about database and collection in the report. And it's also one very strong focus of uh, the Future Pathway work of pro program work. This is the only place where the commissioner recommended to put more money. I said at the beginning, we did not look at the funding or how much funding we needed, but that's one place when the commissioner says there is not enough money to look after database and, um, and collections. And we need more money there. This is the foundation. This is a pillar of science. If you don't have the database and collection, it is very hard for our scientists to do his work or her work. So, and finally, that comes back to the learning that I have done in two years in terms of um, chief science advisor to a um, parliamentary commissioner to the environment who is himself advising the government in some ways. I probably wouldn't like me using the word advising, um, advising the government of uh, ways to improve the legislation and the regulation for the benefit of the environment, and in fine, improve the well being of the environment. So how was the move after three years at Niwa in a safe environment where I was going on the vessel in Tangaroa, I was looking at my data, I was quite specific, I knew what I was looking at, and I was in my circle of confidence, moving outside this circle of confidence and becoming sort of a, what, um, you know, those um, Pilke 2007 theory of the honest broker of policy alternatives, it's a bit aged now, but it's still quite relevant. So how you became a pure scientist to a, what a, probably are more now a knowledge broker. So you're advising with the knowledge that you can gather. I'm not a specialist of any of those topics. I don't know much about weeds, except what I in my garden. I don't know much about chemicals, except that I know now I'm not spraying my weeds anymore. And I don't know, but I know enough, but I need to get a big network of specialists and to understand what they have to tell me so I can report, I can discuss with the commissioner and can advise um, accordingly. I think in New Zealand, we're very lucky though. I think in New Zealand, the use of evidence is well thought after. Well, we can do better. We have to remember that we, the commissioner, the role, my role and the role of the commissioner is to provide advice, but at the end of the day, it is only the government, the elected government, elected by the people of New Zealand that will make the decisions. We will take them for account. We will, we will report to them and say, well, we suggested you do this, you have not et cetera. We, uh, we need to understand each other raison d'etre. I needed to put a bit of French in my talk, otherwise you would have been surprised I've got such an accent, but we needed to understand a bit the raison d'etre of each other. So uh, who, who are the policy makers, who are the scientists, how they can talk to each other. I think there's still a gap. I don't think that's a, a school. There's still a gap between the pure scientists, the scientists who focus on their research, who are passionate about them and about their area of research and the policy maker will need to be make this decision quickly. There is a time gap, there is a, a knowledge gap, there is a, a and the role of um, someone like me maybe is to be, and that's to steal some of the work of Peter Glutman. So um, let me give back to Cesar, we'll bump to Cesar. Uh, really Jeff Roy, this is, this is really interesting, but we are seven minutes over time. Um, I'm finished, and, that's my last yeah. one. Yeah, sorry. We really, we've really got to move on to Luke. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's it. That's what I wanted to make. So. You know, once a scientist, always a scientist, move to once a policymaker, always a policymaker, can we change that and share a bit more of the knowledge? Awesome. Thank you very much for that talk. And if anyone has questions, could um, they please put them in the chat um, and they can be responded to there. Yep. All right.
And I'd now like to introduce Luke Oldfield. Um, we'll see, see how his slides work because he's on a slightly dodgy internet connection. But Luke is a co-leader of um, Tayaga, the Tertiary Education Action Group Aotearoa, which you will have seen in the media doing a lot of work over the last couple of years, speaking up for particularly precarious academics. And over the last two months, they have worked with the Tertiary Education Union and the New Zealand University Students Association to do a survey of precarious academics. And um, we are very lucky to be the first people to hear the results of that survey outside the survey group. Um, so Luke, please take it away. You're on mute, Luke. Now I'm off mute, okay. Uh, thank you, Lucy, I do, do appreciate the introduction and thank you, Rob, also uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, kia ora tato, everyone. Um, I had an interesting day. I started at three o'clock this morning, watched my beloved Black Caps lose, uh, thumped by a fairly wide margin. Uh, I then sat in the shower for about half an hour, thinking about the loss, rather devastated, and then put my slides together. So. Uh, do forgive me uh, if there are some typographical errors um, in uh, some of my um, presentation today. Uh, hopefully it's come together sufficiently that I can give you an overview of, of some interesting tidbits that we found uh, in our survey. Um, first things first, I thought I'd just very briefly talk about uh, who we are. For those of you who, who haven't uh, met myself or any of my colleagues, um, we formed the Tertiary Education Action Group Aotearoa uh, in May of last year, uh, and we did so in response to some of the austerity measures uh, that we, I'm sure all of you were familiar with in the first six months of 2020. Okay, and so in, in, in my case, uh, I, I worked across three universities last year, uh, and I got almost identical emails from those universities starting in around February, uh, suggesting that, you know, due to uh, the lack of international students and, and the necessity to maintain the budget, even though it wasn't really that necessary, uh, that there would be, you know, some cost cutting around the edges. And that was obviously of concern to precariously employed academics because uh, we know that if there is cost cutting, then we're usually first on the chopping block. Uh, so, you know, we've been meeting uh, rather infrequently, usually on sort of a bi-monthly basis to discuss issues within the sector. Um, and we've got representatives and affiliates now across most universities in the country. And uh, you can see this on our website, but we've kind of come together uh, in the first three months and, and agreed upon three key, uh, sorry, 10 uh, key aims, uh, which are on our website, uh, which can be distilled further into four broad areas. So I'll just go over those four broad areas today. Uh, one, uh, absolutely, necessary is greater support for postgraduates. So um, we have on our website discussions around the need for uh, more enhanced spend on mental health, for example, but also the reinstatement of the, uh, the postgraduate student allowance, which uh, I'm sure you'll be aware was a promise of 2017 uh, Labor government uh, before, sorry, 2017 uh, Labor Party uh, in their campaign uh, to become a government. Uh, we want to see the end of, of the exploitation of international students, okay? Um, we want to see an enhancement of the rights of precarious workers, all right, so that they're not just uh, easily dispensed with. Um, and we want to see progress, uh, legitimate progress, not just a shuffling of the numbers uh, when it comes to equity for Māori and Pacific scholars, and fixing the academic pipeline, which is obviously uh, related to also how we support our postgraduate students. And finally, we want to question the role uh, of online learning uh, post-pandemic, okay? So we understand the role that there is a role for uh, having, having online learning services available, perhaps as complementary, uh, but not uh, well, ensuring that those don't actually replace face-to-face uh, -face learning. Uh, and many of you that are, that are arts oriented will, will understand certainly the value uh, of face-to-face -face, uh, in terms of building that social infrastructure, that social capital. And I know that those of you in STEM, uh, the, there's certain realities involved with, with being uh, on site as well. Okay, so questioning uh, what some of our vice chancellors have been saying in recent years. Uh, one, you, one discussed the pandemic in the context of it being an opportunity to Spotify the learning experience. And that's certainly something um, that, that picked our interest as perhaps not being um, in the best interests of our students. Uh, so what have we been doing uh, as, as the Tertiary Education Action Group Aotearoa? Well, we've been making a lot of noise in the media, um, as you may be aware, 
Uh, we started anonymously, uh, anonymously and we were pushing back on AUT's block teaching proposal. Um, you would have seen that it was an idea that the uh, executive at AUT had for a period that they, during the lockdown, the first lockdown last year, uh, would move the university uh, semester structure from 12 weeks to four weeks. Um, obviously, that was concerning um, as, to, as to how that would play out for students who were disadvantaged in particular, who had, who had to miss weeks of their education. We also pushed back on University of Auckland's work for free request, which we thought um, perhaps wouldn't be all that um, uh, easy for those of us who have things like rent to pay, you know, or, or transport costs or like do, doing things like eating um, on, on, a, on a regular basis. Uh, we launched uh, an open letter to the Honourable Minister Hipkins, signed by over 600 academics, asking for an increase of funding uh, in the broader tertiary sector. Um, I, to, to, to be fair to, to the minister, I know that he has been busy uh, with the, you know, with, with the pandemic, and so even though it's been 18 months, I'm sure that response is just around the corner. Uh, we also published opinion pieces. You can Google search those, uh, Tiga. Uh, opinion pieces that are in stuff, um, some of the headlines there on the right. We launched campaigns to bring attention to uh, funding issues uh, in the sector. Um, we wrote our first academic paper, uh, reflected on our experiences as precarious workers during the academic, uh, sorry, during the pandemic. Uh, we've discussed and fraternised with uh, Australian counterparts to share activist strategies. And uh, finally, bringing me to uh, the, the point for today or the discussion point for today, we launched the Precarious Work and Academia Survey in September of 2021. So what was the purpose of this survey? Well, earlier this year, uh, as we were advocating uh, for uh, more uh, robust and permanent funding streams for ECRs, uh, the Honourable Dr. Beryl um, advised MB uh, advised us that we would have the opportunity, should we like to develop a survey uh, in collaboration with MB uh, related to the stresses faced by early career researchers. And so we had some preliminary discussions at that time and it was really fruitful to hear what the priorities of, of MB would be uh, going forward in the short to medium uh, term. Uh, but what it also led us to believe is that we might want to run our own survey and to get a, a sort of a more complete picture of the situation. Um, and one of the reasons that we wanted to do that is we wanted to capture the experiences of precarious academic workers from across the pipeline and not just our ETRs, those who, are, uh, who have completed a PhD and are, and are currently cycling through uh, precarity, but those that will inevitably be cycling through precarity in the next couple of years, or those who might be at risk of, of falling short uh, for various reasons, okay? Uh, we wanted to also test the assumptions about precarious uh, about what the precarious workforce looked like um, and we were concerned that that different groups were still um, uh, characterizing precarious work as something that mostly young people did that were just not sufficiently qualified and that the overwhelming majority of, of those that were in precarious work situations in academia were uh, were, were young people, right? Sort of uh, akin to doing an apprenticeship and, and you have to deal with, uh, with the dramas of, of being an apprentice with some not particularly pleasant bosses. And then one day you get to be the boss and you get to tell what to people what to do. We felt that that um, was sort of an un antiquated understanding of how, uh, of how academia now operated. We wanted to ensure uh, that we could make substantive claims about the experience of people across various disciplines, okay, and not just being uh, a group of arts people or a group of STEM people making broad generalizations about precarious work situations uh, in academia. Uh, and finally, uh, we wanted uh, to work uh, with, it, with the unions, the TEU and NZUSA, uh, uh, to provide them with uh, the necessary data they needed to do to do advocacy uh, for the sector leading into 2022. All right, and so it's very grateful, as, as Lucy pointed out, that the TU and, and NZUSA lent their support to developing uh, survey questions. I was also grateful to Lucy herself and also Max, uh, uh, Lara and Sidiana, among others, um, who, who assisted with both the survey design, uh, survey design and, uh, and then also disseminating that survey uh, out you know, through various social media channels. So um, look, this I could I could talk for a couple of hours about the research findings. Um, we, we don't have sufficient time today, and I just thought I'd just grab just a couple of, of sort of interesting tidbits um, that you might want to take away. 
Uh, I'm also conscious of the fact that, that we've promised uh, the unions that we're going to give them a, a full report in, in two or three weeks' time, and I, I don't necessarily want everything to head out on Twitter this afternoon. So um, I, I guess some of the big picture data uh, from the survey. So we, we opened it in September. It closed four weeks later in October. Uh, we had 760 complete responses, which was fantastic. It was more than what we anticipated. Um, and there were some interesting things to come from it, right? So I, I guess just first things first on the right-hand side there, um, you can see that um, for the most part, those who responded, it, it sort of reflects fairly well with, with what the FTE numbers are for those institutions. So perhaps unsurprisingly, we had the most responses from vicarious workers at the University of Auckland being the biggest or the largest institution. Um, and, and every single institution, we had a minimum of 50 responses with the exception of, of Lincoln, which is obviously a much smaller uh, institution compared to some of the others. A couple of the, the interesting tidbits uh, from the survey, just coming back to this, you know, who are precarious workers? Uh, as you can see by the graph there, over a third now of those who identify as precarious academic workers are over the age of, of 35. Okay, um, so this kind of um, incorrect categorization of, of uh, who are precarious workers is something that we need to reevaluate re in our discussions. Another interesting point there as well, uh, perhaps more concerning than it is interesting, is that 49% or thereabouts uh, of people that filled out our survey said that they were doing three or more precarious contracts a year. Uh, so what that does suggest to you that, that it, as well as, as doing their own studies, uh, as well as tutoring, they're probably doing research contracts on top, or they're doing multiple research contracts uh, for those of those for those that are still studying. For those that have completed their studies, they're trying to cobble together what's necessary just to survive. You know, in, in cities like Auckland and, and Wellington, um, in particular, we know that 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 you know the cost of living is, is well, it's got to a point where it's egregious. I mean, let's let's not mince words. So, um, th there's a situation there where perhaps. Uh, universities or institutions and government might need to look at, at how they streamline employment processes in a way that uh, that people are just being onboarded perhaps once per year rather than three or four or five or more times per year. Um, what we also did in our survey uh, is we asked uh, what steps that we believe that 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 we thought for curious workers thought or sorry I should say that again what steps for curious workers thought government universities and unions could take uh, so that equality, autonomy, and respect could be improved uh, within institutions. And when I was just flicking through some of the data this morning, I, I plucked out some of the things that popped up regularly. All right, so this is in no particular order, um, and the end. And there might be more things that we include in our interim and final reports. But I, I picked out three for, for each of the three groups, and, and I'll just run through each of those with a little bit of a commentary. So. Um, the first one there is, is to modify, for, this was for government, okay, so this is what precarious workers thought government could do. Uh, they said that um, they could modify the conditions upon which universities can employ people on casual contracts, okay, so there's certainly an appetite there for uh, a legislative uh, change to ensure that there is a little less precarity uh, for those uh, that are on, on casual contracts, and, and a movement towards the option for fixed term uh, contracts uh, where applicable. Okay, so that might be in, a, in say a tutoring or a research assistant type position, may only be three to six months. Combining those together, if they're multiple contracts, and providing that for, for one whole year. Um, another, which I know is, is very much relevant to the discussions that are going on at the moment uh, with MB, is to alter the research funding landscape, um, which you know leading to which has led to rolling precarity among ECRs. Okay, so moving away from that ultra competitive funding model and the commodification of tertiary education more broadly. Um, it, it's, it's something that we talk about in arts all the time. It, it's, it almost seems ridiculous that we have universities domestically competing with each other for domestic students, you know, advertising on the, on the clothing of rugby teams or on the back of buses and so on. Um, also, one thing that I might add as well to this discussion around the funding landscape is, is, is a bit of a an ignorant peasant myself who's currently finishing their PhD and, and drawing from conversations I've had with others as well, is that you almost need a Rosetta Stone these days to understand where funding comes from. And, and that's a point that I made to, uh, to MB last week. 
uh, unless you have that institutional knowledge already or you have a supervisor that understands how to access research, research grants, you almost you know, just feel overwhelmed with where, where to go and, and where to establish yourself. And a lot of people that are coming through the PhD uh, or coming through and completing PhDs, uh, they don't know where to go next, okay? They're, they're, they're super reliant on, on, on those that are above them to, to carry them forward. And, and for some people, their PhD supervisor, the most important thing to them is that their student completes their PhD, right? Because that's the tick in that promotion box for them. So uh, we need to, uh, before we can, for some of us, before we can make submissions on what MB uh, wants, what, uh, on the MB white paper, we need to understand completely what the research environment looks like and where funding comes from. Uh, another point that, that came, across, uh, came across quite frequently uh, is that uh, there was a, a strong desire for a regulatory framework at a central level, um, particularly a way to manage employment disputes in our institutions, uh, perhaps similar to primary and tertiary education, uh, but also something that we, we can identify bullies um, and, and, and people that are, that are engaged in nefarious activities and then institution jumping. All right, so um, being able to hold them to account might be a lot easier if we have a, a central system for, for perhaps how we register people that work in our institutions um, and then that move on to other institutions. Um, so the next, next slide here is, is how universities uh, can uh, enhance equality, autonomy and respect. And um, speaking to three points that came through quite frequently here, the first and, and probably the most a uh, common one was there needed to be a more substantive move towards partnership with Māori and, and building beyond just diversity hiring. So there had been uh, efforts and, and noticeable efforts to, to hire a broader range of academic, academics in, uh, in our learning institutions. Uh, however, uh, there, what it didn't necessarily translate to respect for te ao Māori uh, from the upper echelons of, of university management. Um, there also needed to be more uh, appreciation for the lived experience of Māori and Pacific academics. Okay, this was a frequent theme as well, dealing with uh, institutional racism uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, the second point that came up uh, quite frequently was that there needed to be faster onboarding processes for researchers, for RAs, for tutors, and so on. Um, and, and really, the, this is just a consequence of, of, of austerity and neoliberal cost cutting over the decades is that We've cut to the bone the number of frontline administrative staff at our learning institutions, at our universities, uh, particularly at department level. And then we've made them sort of school level positions that are a lot less uh, personal. Uh, and that's meant that contracts are often sent late, uh, are often incomplete or often incorrect. And finally, um, there was a, a, a desire to see more consistency and fairness, okay? So piece rates, that's the amount you get paid for marketing assignment. Uh, for example, for doing a particular piece of research work, uh, for teaching or research contracts, they vary wildly, even within faculties, within institutions. And so there was a desire to see a little bit, a little bit more transparency about how people were paid so that they were paid fairly. Uh, and then also uh, a desire for PhD students and, and for ECRs as well, uh, to have the uh, ability to uh, actually refuse work, um, uh, rather than, than wonder if they're going to get a job the same job that they were doing last year, could they do that same job again? Um, or would it be a case of, uh, you know, so that job was going to be given to somebody else? Um, I do realise I need to wrap up. So this will be the last slide here, Lucy. Yep, uh, last 30 seconds. So the final thing was, was unions and advocacy groups. Um, how, how could equality, autonomy and respect be improved? Um, the overwhelming response here was that, and perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the participants, 760 of them, uh, all uh, not all of them, but a number of them talked about the fact that they wanted to see advocacy groups and unions reorientate themselves uh, towards the needs of precarious academics. Okay, so no surprises there. So I do want to thank the Tertiary Education Union in particular for funding uh, this piece of research because that, and, and then also agreeing to collaborate with them on this uh, important topic uh, leading into 2022. Over to you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, and again, if anyone has questions, they can go in the chat because we're now going to move on uh, to our final um, talk for the day. Uh, can you drop your screen sharing, Luke, please? 
Right, we're now going to be moving on to our final talk for the day, um, which is Troy Baisden, the president of NZAS, um, who is going to be speaking to us about um, giving his president's address and speaking about the Te Arapairangi uh, submission that NZAS will be making, which hopefully some of you have been contributing to in our slides throughout today. And I'll go tell. I'll jump right into it because we're well, I think, beyond time <coughs> at this point. Um, and we'll find out, <coughs> excuse me, if Lucy is better at kicking me off the stage. Um, I have given a couple of talks now on this topic. And I found, first of all, that people really appreciate learning some more about, um, what do I need to do? So share screen. Dangerous while talking. OK. Um, Hopefully this is going to work. Hopefully. Seems like. Bear with me just a second while I get the screen sharing going properly, oh dear. It always seems easy until you try to do it. Um, there we go. Can everybody see the slides now? Yes. Can you see a whole bunch of other garbage? Nope. Excellent. That's a good sign, okay. <clears throat> So I've given this talk a couple times. Um, the name of the talk actually comes from a, roughly from a comment from Sean Hendy with an NZAS council meeting. We've been contemplating that Aotearoa really needs a reshaping, a originally what we called a renewal of the New Zealand science system. So let's get stuck into how we've been thinking about that. Um, first of all, I'll, probably save most of this for the AGM at this point, but I want to thank a number of people involved in NZAS for what we've been doing this year. Um, because we're a little bit beyond our time, I'll uh, go through this as a um, president's report at the AGM more than I will at the, the conference. Um, particular things I'd like to just quickly highlight here are the renewal document itself, our responses to the cuts at various universities, um, and our efforts to understand Maturang and science for the report on that for the nation, relatively minor, but what's quite significant has been our effort to understand ECR issues and generate responses from within council that have led to national coordination there. Lucy's led that, particularly Georgia, who you've met today, has been leading an ECR group on Slack that has proven tremendously useful. Um, some aspects of the university issues are a bit concerning. Um, again, I don't want to dwell here, and I had planned to talk about this a little bit, but I'm concerned about rapidly moving through with time. I think the biggest single thing we learned from universities has been that it has been extraordinarily difficult, despite finding what a minister called, as an, ele called an elegant solution in her open letter, to really open up the issues in any way that allow us to address issues going on inside universities with the required level of transparency. That perhaps remains something to be looked at with how stable um, research funding in the future looks within research institutions. What are the bigger problems that we have within the system that we can begin to look at when we start to unpack what's possible for renewal and what's within Te Araparangi uh, future pathways green paper. Um, the first is that PhD scholarships were low. They've just been ra raised back up to the minimum wage. How, is that really worth it for getting our brightest people to go into science? Especially when beyond that, career pathways are a mess, and perhaps that doesn't contribute to improving the diversity of science. Are our institutions actually unstable, perhaps because there's the wrong number or the wrong structure of funding? 
wrong number of institutions. Do too, does too many institutions lead to too much competition or is it something else? On the other hand, we can see that many of us are relatively lucky if we have stable jobs. We were all surprised to learn the Science Media Center has been on year to year funding. Um, so they were the ultimate example, despite their importance of a, um, an organization with funding precarity that's actually doing remarkably well. Internationally, we have unusually high overheads and those mass claims that research expenditure can be poorly categorized, may not be research in some of our institutions or goes heavily into marketing or other behaviors like rent seeking or in general, some issues which I think are best characterized as um, our institutions primarily being financially driven rather than uh, strategy driven. You would think it would all work, but we'll start to unpack what we might do to try to understand why this is occurring and how we could all respond together um, to think about why that is and, and uh, what some of the drivers might be that are actually able to be addressed as a system rather than individually. If we ultimately extrapolate in the directions in our institutions, where does it lead in five, 10 or 20 years? I mean, I think that's the big question we need to ask ourselves. And how will that give us confidence that our system can address our national priorities? So we started this by working towards what we called a connected, evidence-based, adequately funded, harmonized research ecosystem as a goal we need to pursue. Now is the time. We worked on this paper for a year. There was no particularly good time to release it. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Craig Stevens for leading this effort, not me. Um, it's primarily the effort pulling together a lot of feedback. Um, what was in that? 11 points for renewal. Um, I encourage you to read it as you're thinking about Toyota Future Pathways. You can see the first of these is valuing people. The last of them is gaining data on the system. I'll now move into trying to understand what is actually in the Future Pathways consultation. One of the key points is that the areas it directly aims to affect are the funding controlled by MB, which you see here, ranging from the strategic science investment funding for CRIs, the institutional structure of CRIs, and the biggest contestable research funds in the country. It does not include some other things, including the university funding, PBRF, centers of research excellence, and some other items there. Um, so it's the area bounded in red here. What's also interesting about this diagram is that the base for the diagram is competition rather than stable institutions. The institutions sit at the top of the diagram in terms of how it's structured. <clears throat> Moving quickly along, let's just remember that the system formed in its, as it presently stands in 1992 and it largely cemented by 2010. There have been a number of key reports in the last four years that look at big, big issues. The first is that the New Zealand productivity paradox has not been addressed compared to similar nations with similar uh, structures and economic systems. We continue to have an underperforming economy in terms of GDP per, per capita or labor productivity. Why is that? Is it our ineffective use of science and technology to raise productivity? We're not prioritizing well. We're not doing great on diversity or tetriti, and we might backslide as a result of COVID. We definitely have serious career and workforce issues and we're heavily dependent on overseas recruitment that has at least temporarily stalled due to COVID. We have particular anomalies for linking internationally, including high overheads, relatively bespoke institutional structures, and some issues with contorted governance and poor connectivity across the system. At this conference, 11, 10 years ago, sorry, 11 years ago, Sean Hendy presented this paper. It led to the idea that if we made our innovation ecosystem more connected, we might actually overcome that productivity paradox. Through the book, Get Off the Grass, which he wrote with the late Sir Paul Callahan, 
it led to the creation of Te Punaha Matatini, one of the centers of research excellence which Sean has led. This paper was put forward about the time Sean was president of the NZAS. So there's sort of a DNA in here that the NZAS has in terms of trying to address this issue. And it's one that's carried through Te Punaha Matatini. Yet the cabinet papers suggest that we have failed to address this issue and the data that's available also raises concerns about that. We're not generating a research system that's capable of organizing our efforts to combat climate change or other big issues like biodiversity loss, water. Um, is it gen are we able to generate sustained improvements on health and well-being? Perhaps we're slightly better there. And we're remarkably lucky in how our system has addressed COVID. But overall, there's a sense in the paper that started this consultation that our RSI system is not well configured to meet these challenges and opportunities. The paper aims to address the parts that are not working well, strengthen the role of Maori in the system, how the system achieves outcomes for Maori, address connectivity, fragmentation, and responsiveness to priorities, possibly prioritization itself. Some biased observations from my seat as the president of NZAS are that we've absorbed as a nation the idea that market-driven ideology will solve our problems and incorporated it in our institutions. CRIs were a great model for this. Arguably, it's worked very well in a few cases, plant and food research probably being the most obvious, well matched to a sector and commercial opportunity and mechanisms of its own renewal. However, there are some other oddities in our system and the other CRIs were not well matched to the problems that emerged over the 30 years since they were created. Problems like climate change are better matched and natural hazards are better matched by institutions that are more public and less designed to create a mix of research and commercial functions for synergies between the two. The other interesting issue is that there's an interesting university versus CRI divergence in universities becoming more fundamental and strate or strategic in a sort of bland international sense in their activity, whereas CRIs are retaining a focus on New Zealand's needs because of their commercial activity. Neither is bad, but it's a relatively odd divergence that's not ser serving the development of a workforce well. Connections and integration are also disadvantaged. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, DI, DEI is not looking good. Ultimately, I think one of the solutions to this is to look more at people breaking out of the system as it is into smaller pieces that are, are able to be the connectors within the system. That could be think tanks, it could be particular individuals. They should retain links with universities and public research institutes where public research institutes is a new term that's emerged for what CRIs might become under this consultation. What we're consulting on um, or what the consultation aims to break this problem up into is essentially six parts. Priorities, the aspirations and development of Matranga and Tariti relationships. I would argue those two are actually best addressed at the end if we can fix the other four. Funding, institutions, probably the core one for most of you is the workforce itself. And for many, the ability to equip ourselves both with buildings to sit in and infrastructure to do our science with is very important. So again, if we could address those last four, wouldn't the first two better take care of themselves? Or at least the, the aspirations and role of Māori would be a test of whether we've done everything else well. Some data we can quickly apply to this has become available. What are some examples of that? Um, some of it is in fact, <coughs> available, but was poorly connected in the green paper. Um, there's a number of sources here. Many of it you'll be familiar with if you've been following what the association's been doing. In terms of responding to priorities, this is an interesting example and one that's only available if you digest budget data to take every year in sequence because 
what we're left with with past budgets is only the blue line. But if we look at the information reported each year, we see the, the information for that year is green. And for the next year, what's budgeted a year ahead is yellow. And we can see that when national challenges came into a being, we were continually told they would develop money um, and develop spending much faster than they actually did. Similarly, when we once tried to address climate change in 2008 to 2010, um, when the Copenhagen Agreement fell over, there was a general failure to spin up work as fast as was expected. And we're seeing something similar today, which is a little bit of a crying wolf tale, sort of the opposite where we're now spinning up work faster um, than was originally projected in terms of its need to address climate change. This is one of the most vexing problems. Now, remember I told you that there was a big effort to address connectivity to lift New Zealand's economic performance. This is what actually happened. So this is universities, Crown Research Institutes and universities, 50% it's the same point on both graphs now. And we have 2009 to 2019. In both cases, the graphs bottom out and don't really recover except for the largest firms where businesses are trying to connect with Crown Research Institutes and universities in 2013. Why might that be that we have this drop and no re real recovery? We might guess that it had something to do with the government policies of the day, but it's difficult to necessarily tell which one, the development of Callahan Innovation, the move of the re research and science and innovation framework into um, MB as it is now, um, or perhaps some other things like the lack of a tax incentive or grants policy for a little while. Something's not working. I mentioned also that we could look at the diver divergence of CRIs and universities. Here, I want to emphasize that applied knowledge provision within universities, where we look at university research as a function of GDP. First of all, we don't see at least until 2017 that university research was increasing in it as a percent of GDP as much as we might have thought it was. Second, we see that it's actually becoming less applied and potentially therefore less um, good at making jobs um, for an applied labor force. And if we wanted to recruit people into an excellent labor force, this is a graph Lucy has made and has now been very successful with. We see the Marsden stipend actually fell below the minimum wage here fell below the training wage here, which led to some alarm and pushing forward. And it was actually a, a Minister Aisha Verrill that recommended to us that we write to the Marsden Council. And so an open letter was prepared for the Marsden Council. And um, that's led to the increase back to the minimum wage, but it remains less than the living wage. And we remain still stuck with career pathways, which don't necessarily line up to future jobs. So where can we go with this? I'll be coordinating a limited amount of work within Te Punaha Matutini. Um, we see some hackathons as one opportunity there and also an opportunity to further upskill people in trying to understand um, what it is that we're talking about here, what it is that we're trying to connect together on and what the overall solutions in the system might be. How do we can, how can we put data on those? Because as you heard, the minister wants to see this in data. She wants to be convinced. At the same time, we need to think about what paradigms can drive the transformation that's needed and how can we sequence that? One significant challenge is that the innovation literature metrics don't neatly map to climate change or well-being issues so much as they map to patents and producing papers. Again, I've talked about this as one idea. I've been really struggling to think about what might provide some commonalities here and what's wrong. And I've come to one thing which I'm gonna recommend everybody actually take a look at. Um, there's an arc of history here where if we go back to some of the literature that New Zealand may have missed along the way, one I've harped on before and that doesn't seem to make all the difference is post-normal science. The idea that when we look at big issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, catchment scale and larger scale water issues, natural hazards and sea level rise, for example, 
We need different institutions and different ways of thinking than we do about developing commercializable research. However, we don't seem to have great ways of getting this funded and getting it funded in ways that are compatible with um, Maori inclusion, with Te Tiriti, and with wider diversity inclusion. What we may have missed, I think, that does bring a lot of this together is Eleanor Ostrom's 1998 address to the um, American Political Science Association. She's a noted economist and um, political science specialist, and she combined some aspects of Nash equilibrium, game theory, and social dilemmas that resemble our repeated efforts to get this right and find that it keeps going wrong. That's sort of the point of social dilemmas. Look up the prisoner's dilemma if you get a chance. It's a very simple one to try to understand. Her suggestion is that to get this right, we need to actually build a relationship that builds trust, that builds a desire for government to want to invest in science and institutions to go around this loop. And what they need to do to generate net benefits is to develop better levels of cooperation. This is our chance to try. Unfortunately, we may have to put in some of the effort purely off of our um, off of our um, spare time and weekends at the moment to try to get it across the line, although any institutional support will be highly desirable. Um, a few of the concepts in here that I think are highly desirable for sort of working in these directions are that things happen and we get suboptimal outcomes from systems. They actually get worse when we repeat the cycle, but they're ameliorate, ameliorated by communication, by people working together, and that's what this loop is all about, or developing systems that build secondary goals, good goals, within these systems and that help that us work towards cooperation as a result. That's what we should see in our science institutions. And that's what we should see if we begin working together as communities to achieve the right thing. So just some quick, big questions. Can we better enable an economy that generates startups? Can we better enable an economy that generates think tanks? Perhaps even should NZAS actually become one rather than just an underfunded um, organization. Are many less institutions the best way to overcome competition? Many less institutions are a better way to overcome competition. That's certainly one item that the um, consultation seeks to address. Would it help us with strategic thinking and prioritization? And what direct funding, if we're talking about base funding, would help people begin to achieve what's needed. Thanks. I don't know if there's much time at all for questions. We're definitely 10 minutes over time. But I will pull up the Q&A and see what there is. Perhaps Lucy or somebody else is ready to there are a couple of Q&A questions, Troy. There we go. If you want me to read them or something. But... I think I've... You good? Well, go ahead if you're ready. Um... Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong panel. Yep. That's all right, I'll read out. Um, so there's one from Michael who says, thanks, Troy, yes, but shouldn't lose sight of the fact that researchers outside of universities are involved in education, supervision of research students, increasingly uh, including polytechs as well. Effectively, research grants are used to subsidize university education provision without any funding coming back the other way. I suppose it's more of a comment, but um, yeah. Well, I think that is worth addressing. I mean, that, that's actually something that my earlier slides and our efforts to better understand what was happening in Massey and perhaps other universities attempted to investigate. What we found and what we tend to see where oh, there's concerns the Australian corporate university model may be coming across is um, that some universities are starting to act more like polytechs. It's difficult to track in money inside universities, but the Auditor General's office actually pointed us to different parts of university reports, which list quite different levels of funding for research, arguing that universities still treat in their annual reports that there's a subsidy across the way from, from teaching to research. 
I do find that interesting. Mm -hmm. Question remains, um, how can we look at that transparently and begin to understand whether there is actually an ongoing functionality in the research university as we know it, where the expected synergies between research and teaching as defined in the university, in the university, uh, sorry, the Education Act are acting as expected um, versus a perhaps better system to have and more common internationally, for example, in state universities is to begin to have institutes functioning as research funding entities within universities that are connected, but somewhat separate from teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, Michael, I didn't realize it was for the previous presentation. Anyway, um, there is <laughs> there is another one um, from an anonymous attendee, and that's talking about the open letter approach that we've used a few times this year. Um, I'm interested in the open letter approach. NZAS and many others have taken this last year. I admit to some hesitation that this is a good way to engage. Despite having signed a few, it feels like a squeaky wheel slash cancel culture approach to research issues yet has also got a lot of media attention. And I wonder whether we can get visibility for various important issues by creating alternative approaches to publicizing issues. Good point. I, um, I think it's been very effective when it's targeted a narrow goal. However, if we continue to do more and more of them or have multiple open letters going on the same topic, I think we may find that they become less and less effective. Yeah. Okay, um, if that's it, we probably want to wrap up, don't we, for the AGM and at four? I think that is the case, and I'll really point people to the notion that this is an ongoing consultation. Kuhn in particular prepared a, um, a presentation that you can type into um, and um, add some extra material to, and we're trying to figure out what to do next. So the AGM, so on and so forth, are very much what we'd like to see our members at NZAS participating in and telling us what to do next. There's the ECR group that Georgia runs for ECRs to jump into that. And um, email us, we're here and listening. What else? Um, the other thing I would like to point out in conclusion is that, um, got some, Things coming up in the, in the chat. Um, Ocean's looking for a um, link to the 11 points. So on that one, we'll get that out. And that's um, on our website. If you look around in the news pages on our website, um, it will um, take you through our to our paper, which has one pager with 11 points at the front of it. Last point to wrap things up. Thanks, Rob. That's now in the chat. A key thing that I encourage you all to come to is also the awards at 5 p.m. Find out who the NZAS medalists are for this year. Thank you all. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. No, my, oh, sorry. Just. Thanks, everybody, for participating um, in today's conference.